So Galahad is the son of Lancelot and Elaine and the grandson of King Pelas. And one of the first questions we might ask is, who is this Joseph of Arimathea that King Pelas seems to have some connection to? Um, king Pelas is the king of the Grail castle and he has inherited the Grail from Joseph of Arimathea. Tradition held that Joseph of Arimathea, who was one of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish High Council, um, was present at the death of Christ and he actually collected together certain artifacts, the spear that pierced Christ's side, the, the, the crown of thorns, the cup at the Last Supper, um, as well as pieces of the true cross, and he brought them to England and he helped to found England as a holy nation by using these relics, these relics of great power uh, near the, 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 chur the, the church of Glastonbury. And his, um, his connection then makes a connection between England and the Holy Land itself, a direct connection between what happened, the salvation of all humanity in Christ, and then the founding of England itself. Uh, consequently, King Pallas is the heir to all this and he holds that grail in his castle. One of the uh, second questions after this is, what is this grail? What do we know about this grail? One thing that we know about the Holy Grail, first off, is that it is a, pr is a prominent image in English artwork. It shows up again and again in English artwork. Some people suggest that the Grail uh, goes back to ancient uh, Celtic lore, to Welsh lore, and certainly we see it throughout Celtic uh, artwork in different forms. It is always uh, an emblem or a representation of uh, holy actions, and the giving of wine. It is in shape, it is um, like an hourglass. It, the, the cup shape looks like an hourglass or looks like a, uh, an infinity sign. Um, in the structure, it's normally silver or gold. Objects that are silver or gold are normally associated with divine power. So this, this grail, even in its early origins, is associated with divine power, the power of the gods, the power of the other world. In our story, it's also associated with the salvation of man. The grail is directly associated with salvation of humanity, the perfection of man in Christ. It is traditionally the cup of the Last Supper, where the consecration occurs, and or it is the cup that caught the blood of Christ from the cross. And we frequently see in artwork Christ on the cross, the blood coming down, and St. John or Joseph of Arimathea or the angels catching that blood in this cup. So it's it is either the Last Supper cup or it's the Grail cup, or it might be both. One way or the other, that image of cup seems to be a metaphor for something else. What is it a metaphor for something else? It is a metaphor for, I think, uh, to, uh, the image of human perfection, uh, man finding his proper place in the world. But it's also at the same time uh, the image of perfection in a woman, that the cup is directly associated with women. We see this in Beowulf, the story of Beowulf, we see this in uh, this Arthur story, we see it in artwork. Women holding the cup of offering seems to be a common theme. This dual metaphor, uh, an object having several meanings at once, it, we call in literature a figura, uh, an Italian term that means that it, it is the figure of something. It embodies all these different metaphorical possibilities and at the same time it is a cup, simply a grail cup. Well, that grail image then in this section of the story, we see as Elaine. And the, 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 the image of Elaine loving Lancelot seems to offer the possibility of change and perfection for Lancelot. But again, he rejects it. Um, he goes and wants Guinevere. And Guinevere ends up being very possessive, almost dragon-like of, of, of Lancelot. And she uh, forces Elaine to sleep in another room. And when Lancelot is tricked to come to Elaine, uh, she hears him, Guinevere does, in the other room talking in his own sleep about how great she is. And she gets all mad, which again is odd because he's talking about how great she is in his sleep. You'd think that she'd be like, oh, you know, Lancelot loves me. But no, he's in bed with Elaine and that's all that matters. Even though Guinevere has her own husband. And this is something that Elaine says to her after, after Guinevere has caused Lancelot to be ashamed and he jumps out a window. Elaine says to Guinevere, you've got your own husband, you've got Arthur. Why would you deny me the possibility of having a good husband in Lancelot? And more to the point, why would you go and ruin Lancelot? 
In many ways, it's because Guinevere um, is a woman who, as yet, is unaware of the damage she causes. She is like the image out of Troy, the Trojan horse. She looks like something beautiful, but has with her the power to destroy, the power of death. She's much like the figure of Helen in that same story, who both makes Troy great and destroys Troy. And in this story, Guinevere makes Camelot great. She, with her comes the round table, and she creates that whole community. But at the same time, it's Guinevere's possessiveness and Guinevere's desire to have this best knight in Lancelot, which causes the entire destruction of the round table and almost the annihilation of Lancelot and almost the annihilation, if not the annihilation, of, Guinevere, of, of Elaine, who's a great, great woman. So we see that, that image coming up over and over again of the grail associated with Elaine, connected to Guinevere as the opposite, and Lancelot not being able to figure out which is the one that he wants. And it drives him crazy, it drives him mad, literally he jumps out the window. And we end this section with Lancelot jumping out the window in shame and terror and running off as a madman into the wilderness. Thank <laughs> you.